Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. This is the five minute chart of gold provided by netdania.com. You can click on the link below. Now you can see here right at the end of the year here we had this fantastic volatility that came in. We had a big gold sell off and we saw that was accompanied in the news by a lot of anti gold stories in the mainstream media. Of course, this is all coordinated. We know that the criminal mafia, central banksters, control the gold price and they control the media as well. The question is, is when are they going to lose control? And uh, I think it's going to be fairly soon, especially when we look at what we're going to see in this video. Now, this is interesting that we have these types of volatility coming in here this type of reversal is very unusual it's uh, it doesn't show up here but it's kind of like a engulfing candlestick sort of formation so we sold off very very rapidly and then had a snapback rally you can see three or four very large blue rallies here very rapid we're on one now as well all the way up to 1235 we hit that would seem to indicate that there's a change going on in the markets. We see this all the time. You can see if you look at the euro, what happened with the euro today. Uh, there was a violent move back down after there had been a significant spike up, you can see here. So uh, the controllers are squaring away their positions and trying to plan for what they're going to do for this year I think it's going to be a very exciting year so let's jump into this gold issue I want you to start off by watching this video from Belange P this is when gold and silver go into hiding we stick it on the blog it's a very important video it's sort of a summary of the ideas of FOFOA and others and it's an explanation of gold and how it functions in the world economic system that the central banksters are running right now and uh, let's watch this explanation and then I'm going to go into more detail about this idea the ideas presented here in 1971 President Nixon closed the gold window this is well known by the gold community, but often the analysis of the next few decades has been very shallow, resulting in the gold community continuously crying out that the dollar has no gold backing. What is often overlooked is that the world's elite still use gold as a means of payment, and that the flow of gold is extremely important to keeping the gears of the world turning. Let's take a look at how the mechanism of gold payment works in our post Bretton Woods world, and what might cause it to fail. What has replaced the gold-backed dollar of the Bretton Woods era is a very cleverly conceived gold-backed currency that relies upon the petrodollar, the gold loan, and the futures market. It works like this. The oil exporting nations, under the leadership of Saudi Arabia, have agreed to accept only dollars in exchange for their oil. In return, the U.S. has guaranteed to, quote, keep the dollar strong in gold. But how does the U.S. do this? Well, mining is a capital-intensive operation and mines need cash right now in order to guarantee the flow of gold well into the future. So bullion banks arrange financing for the mines. The mines receive cash now from bullion banks in return for a promise to deliver gold in the future. This creates a futures contract in gold. The mine is a commercial short and the bullion bank is a commercial net long. The bullion bank is the market maker who gets cash from investors, in this case the oil producers. The bullion bank sells the futures contracts to the oil exporters, who are the counterparty longs to the mining industry's shorts. But this isn't the end of the story, because the oil exporters know that gold in the ground is not the same thing as refined above-ground gold. If all they were interested in was a claim on the gold in the ground, they could simply buy mining shares outright. But that's not what they want. They want real gold. So how do they guarantee that real gold stands behind the futures contract? That's where monetary authorities come into play. They have large stores of official gold 
which they in turn loan out to the bullion banks in the form of gold loans. These loans are a finite term and stipulate that the bullion banks return the gold plus interest at some point in the future. This isn't a transfer of phys physical gold, only a transfer of title. The physical gold stays put. The bullion banks can pay the interest because of the contango on the futures market. If you're not familiar with contango, it is simply the condition where the future gold is priced more highly than spot. It is the way that entities that are willing to warehouse a good can generate a profit, but more on that in a minute. So in this way, the monetary authority can maintain physical possession of the gold and provide assurances to oil exporters that they can get their gold if they decide to stand for delivery on the futures contracts. And voila, what has been created is a paper contract that acts as a warehouse receipt for gold that has the backing of the U.S. government. Does this sound to you like what the dollar used to be? It does to me too. In fact, this is real power money. This is the currency that holds everything together. The gold-backed dollar hasn't died. It has only changed in form. What is needed to keep everything functioning properly is this system I have circled here in blue. It requires that we have bullion banks who can make the market between the oil exporters and the gold miners. It requires that the miners can make a reasonable profit and are willing to hedge their future production. It requires that the monetary authorities are willing to make gold loans. And for several decades, this has worked. So what can cause it to fail? One possibility is that the miners find it difficult to make a profit with the prevailing price available in the futures market. Okay, so I'm going to stop it here. I encourage you to watch the rest of it. It's very informative. But I wanted to delve more deeply into this idea that he's outlining here. So we have these key players. We have the monetary authority. Of course, that's going to be central banks, but primarily the Fed. And then we have the bullion banks. And they're the ones doing the gold loans. And then we have the mining companies. So the question is, is where can this break down? When will this break down? But I wanted to examine first this idea of the gold coming from the mining companies and basically their commercial shorts on their gold. Now, that system can only work if the mining companies actually can make a profit mining gold. The only other alternative to that would be to have some sort of government backing so that the miners could mine at a loss. And I, I suspect that we're nearing that point. In fact, I've suspected for some time now the corruption and complicity of the gold mining company. So let's dig into that further. Let's take a look at Barrick because Barrick is one of the big players in this. This is the all-time chart here going back to 1985 of Barrick Gold. You can see they're an 18 billion dollar company. Now it's very interesting here the stock price of Barrick is actually lower than it was through the latter half of the 90s. You can see that Barrick was from $25 to $30 a share. Now we're all the way down below. We're at $17 a share. So obviously Barrick isn't doing very well. Now you can see if we look at this high price here and go on to the chart that this that spike right there, that comes in at September of 2011 and if we go to the gold chart well the gold chart's going to show us that uh, that big top that we had in gold was in September of 2011 that's when this bear market started right here you can see that right there, September 2011. That's when this bear market started and gold went from 1900 
uh, or maybe call it a mini bear if it's just a retracement in the long term bull but this minor bear market started about 1900 and ran down to below 1200 if we go back to Barrick we can see that their price dropped from above 50 to 17 so more than a 50 percent 60 percent loss on that now the question is going to be how is Barrick involved and how are any of the others involved in this operation it's my contention that there isn't enough gold coming out of the miners to be able to provide gold to have this operation work so let's look at Barrick this is the Wikipedia on Barrick Barrick Gold is the largest gold mining company in the world with its headquarters in Toronto and so this isn't all of them but you have to remember that this is the biggest one in the West we're not talking about what goes on in Russia because they don't export any of their gold we're not talking about what goes on in China because they don't export any of their gold so it's quite possible that Barrick isn't even close to the largest mine, gold mining company in the world but we would never know that but it is in the West and so we want to use that as uh, our test case here now if we go down here we find out that as of December 31st 2008 that's kind of interesting boy they aren't very updated on their statistics it's proven and probable gold mineral reserves stand at hundred and thirty eight point five million ounces or thirty nine hundred tons for the year and I don't think it's much higher I don't think that number has gone up too much since that date probably nearly the same 7.7 .7 million ounces was mine now if you want to figure out that in tons all you have to do is uh, well I'll just tell you it's roughly 5% 7.7 million is 5% of these total mineral reserves so 5% uh, of this 3900 tons comes to roughly 195 tons so let's look real quick here over at the gold imports into Hong Kong from Hong Kong now these have been surging and remember this is just China's admission of their gold imports so think about this we're not only talking about China and Russia not exporting any of their gold but we're also talking about China importing gold and if you remember from the video he was talking about how the oil countries have got their gold stored in the bullion banks and they just changed the title the uh, ownership title of that the gold isn't actually transferred to Saudi Arabia at least that's what's implied from that but let's look at these numbers here you can see that China had monthly imports of gold the high there back in last March was 223 tons of gold and you can see that it came nearly to 150 so I think we're probably going to average about 150 tons and that's probably going to keep going forward here's 148 tons in the past month and again this is just what they admit to so let's look at this and compare this to the figures that we saw from Barrick this figure here five percent of it is about 195 tons okay that's the entire gold production for one year out of Barrick and that is just a little bit more than China is importing per month so at that rate let's say that China imports 150 tons a month it would only take a little over two years two to three years for China to import the entire proven and probable gold mineral reserves of all of Barrick the largest gold mining company in the world so looking at those figures you can see it's clear that 
we are approaching end game on this gigantic bankster scheme that they have running we're probably going to be looking at some type of revaluation of gold and these things can happen fast they can happen overnight now let me give you an example of that this is a quote from IBVC this is the Venezuelan stock exchange and you can see right here we're on Bloomberg and this is the indices and the quote is down 99.9 percent so overnight the Venezuelan stock exchange in name lost 99.9 percent now what actually happened you can see that the quote is two million seven hundred thirty three thousand what they did was they lopped off three zeros so the true value of it didn't really change they're just changing the index but they did this overnight what impact does that have probably not very much but again this is a this is a leading banana republic socialist collectivist statist centrally planned economy which is completely collapsing now let's look at the statistics here this is from trading economics you can see this is the performance of the Venezuelan stock exchange and going back to say roughly 2009 you can see the performance here I guess the price was I don't know maybe a 10,000 or so but it has gone up multiples many many multiples and now they've lopped some zeros off of it but what does this really indicate is this an indicator of economic health well we know that the country is a basket case we know that the country has trouble importing toilet paper we know that the president is going around using the army to suppress prices in their best buy equivalent so this is not a healthy country let's take a look at their currency so if we go back to 2009 roughly the same time frame sorry we slowed down here but it shows basically a six-fold change in the value of their currency a devaluation of roughly 80 or 90 percent uh, this just doesn't go back that far but their currency is on the rocks if we go to the 10-year bond rate let's pull that back to about 2008 the beginning of the financial crisis and what we see when we go and look at their interest rate is that very similar to the Federal Reserve they simply pegged their interest rate from about 2010 on you can see back here in the past they had an interest rate that traded based upon the market and you can see the fluctuations up and down now we have just these flat lines here and now we've got this pegged rate of 10.5 percent interest rate we know that inflation is out of control we know if you can go through and look through all these other statistics but their current accounts deficit is in big trouble they're bleeding money they're running out of cash to import goods so we're probably going to see I'm sorry this is muni bond rates here but we're probably going to see a uh, well that's an ad never mind <laughs> but we're probably going to see a complete collapse in Venezuela within the next year or two because these policies are destroying the economy and that's what you get when you have that type of collectivism and central planning it just simply doesn't work but that's what we have on a worldwide scale we have all of the central banks the western central banks and these are going to be the key players the banksters when we talk about the banksters we're talking about the Western Central Banks, primarily the Federal Reserve, and then we've got the ECB, and we've got the Bank of Japan. They are doing everything they can 
to hold this thing together with bits of string and glue and it's starting to come apart at the seams a very big key to this is going to be this gold leasing that they're doing and the importation of gold into China and we can see that with the number of tons that are going in monthly in China as I said just two to three years of that would take all the reserves that Barrick has uh, they're taking the entire nearly the entire amount that Barrick mines in a year per month into China so it's my contention that that gold has to be coming from the Western Central Banks it can't be coming from the miners because Barrick is the biggest in the world and it's not even close on the numbers China and Russia aren't giving us their figures because they're not exporting any gold so the question has to be where is this gold coming from it's my opinion this gold is bleeding out of the Western Central Banks and once all of that gold is gone, and that is going to be very soon at the current rates, then it's going to be end game. And we're going to see an overnight change in the numbers, something similar to what we're seeing right now in Venezuela. And we'll talk to you next time.